Okay, we, we got to get my presentation up on the screen here. I hope it's going to come up on the screen. <laughs> it was up on the screen before, so. Okay, it looks like maybe it's going to work. That's good. <clears throat> Lots of things to talk about. And you might wonder, um, you know, people well, talk about autism. Uh, first of all, autism is a very, very big spectrum. One end of the spectrum, you got half of Silicon Valley. Yeah, you take out a few social circuits, you get geek circuits. You wouldn't have any computers. You didn't have some autism circuits. Einstein had no language till age three. Steve Jobs had a lot of the traits. And then on the real severe end of the spectrum, you're going to have somebody that maybe can't talk and dress themselves. So you got this huge um, spectrum. And you take a lot of kids that are quirky and different today. Um, not enough's being done to develop the area of strength. I'm an extreme visual thinker. And that helped me in my work with cattle. Because some of the very first stuff that I ever did in cattle handling is I got down in the chute to see what cattle were seeing. And when I did that, people thought that was crazy. But it seemed obvious to me to look at what cattle and other animals were seeing as they walked up the chute. Well, a basic principle in livestock handling is a calm animal is easier to handle. So we definitely got some low stress handling right there. He's completely calm. And a lot of people doing intensive grazing are simply just leading the cattle from one pasture to another. And one really important thing is they've got to have manners. You can't have a mobbing four wheelers, jerking feed off the back of four wheelers, breaking into bags, pushing on gates, and things like that. And one of the things you've got to do is train them to have manners. If they're mobbing and pushing, you don't open the gate. They stand back. Okay, pretty please, I'll put my ears nice and horizontal. Pretty please, then you open the gate. That's a very, very, very basic thing. If you have a situation where an animal, um, I, I worked with uh, training some animals at the Denver Zoo and we had to train them to stand still for multiple blood draws. And to get them to do that, you reward them when they stand still. If you're feeding them the treat while they're jumping all around, now you've just rewarded jumping all around. No, you open the gate when they stand nice, not when they're mobbing. Now, when you've, if you've got some cattle with some really bad manners, you may have to, may the, you know, 15 minutes you may have to stand there. But they'll very, very quickly learn that they've got to be calm uh, going through the gates, controlled movement through gates. You know, there's a lot of people out there now teaching low-stress handling methods. There's different schools of thought on exactly how to do some of these things, but I want to look at outcomes. Controlled movement through gates. You don't want the mama cows rushing into the next pasture, ditching young calves. That's extremely stressful for the mother cows. You want them going through controlled. That is the key. All right, who's getting stressed there? We got some fear stress, we got some pain stress. Now that picture is not Photoshopped. It is real. I think the cowboy's got a sore butt. The horse is pretty scared right now. The steer's probably the one with the probably okay, but the cowboy sure isn't. Now once you get animals all fearful and scared, it takes 20 minutes to calm down. And when the cattle are all agitated, that is fear. Now you walk out in the middle of the pasture and the bull comes after you, that's aggression. Now if the bull's throwing a big fit in a squeeze chute, that is, is fear. I want to just talk a little bit about bull behavior. One of the most dangerous bulls is the hand-reared pet because he thinks he's a person. It's not a tameness issue, it's a mistaken identity issue. He thinks he's a person. So when he gets to be 18 months old, and that's when they start to turn bad and he's sexually mature, got to prove I'm the man. And instead of going out and doing it to the bulls, he does it to people with disastrous results. And a lot of people don't understand the broadside threat where he turns sideways to show you how big he is. Well, you probably don't want to keep a bull that's broadside threatening people. So if you have an orphan bull calf, let's get it onto a cow, or let's make a steer project out of it. I'd like to just get rid of the problem. OK, what are some signs that animals are fearful? Heads up looking around. 
and the genetic differences in fearfulness. You can have some cattle more fearful than other cattle. You get the hot heads in the back of the herd, ears are pinned back, or if the ears are really alert up, they're on the alert. The ears are horizontal. There's some new research from Alan Boissy in France. New paper that just came out and they're looking at ear position. The ears are just kind of forward and horizontal. The cattle are relaxed. When they're pooping, they're pooping because you're scared of you know what out of them. Tail switching like a cat. They are not happy if they're tail switching. And when you start to see eye white, there's now about three or four research studies that, that show that when eye white shows, the animal is really getting upset and fearful. These are warning signs in horses and cattle. They'll warn you before they kick your head off. These warnings, if they're in the squeeze chute, the tail switching and pooping usually happens before they throw a gigantic fit in the squeeze chute. All right, let's look at some of the visual things. Simple visual things that you can correct in a handling facility. Here's a bad one. We're headed right straight into the sun, squeeze chute. Blinding sun. You've all been on the highway getting blinded by the sun. Maybe you want to wait two hours where the sun goes up. There's nothing worse than the sun coming up over the top of a truck when you're trying to load it. Now, animals tend to uh, move towards the light but they're not going to go into blinding light. Now at nighttime, you can use light to attract them into a trailer. You can use light to attract them into a building. They'll head towards the light. But they're not going to go into this kind of blinding sunlight that you see here. This is right at the entrance to a single file um, chute on a ranch. And when I kind of just leaned down at the cattle's height, I could see a car through the fence. Vehicles parked along the sides of handling facilities. Coats put on fences. These are major things that can make cattle tend to balk. I've been in a number of places where I just got vehicles moved and it made a difference. Now you can also see right here a little white plastic jug. And that was going And I do a lot of work with meat packing plants. And I had two meat packing plants where the cattle refused to go up the chute and all that was wrong was the paper towels were wiggling like this. Paper towels. You know, just the littlest thing. And I got rid of the paper towels and they went right in. Now, chains hanging down in chutes. I've been around for a long time. Why do I still have to keep talking about chains hanging down in chutes? Because people aren't taking them out. And this is especially bad if it's right at the entrance where your single file chute starts. I'm getting to not to be a big fan of backstop gates. I'd rather just have a sliding door at the entrance of your single file chute. I got a lot of drawings that have backstops. Cattle are getting so tall now they don't fit under them anymore. And I'm really getting to hate them. And I do have some nice sliding gate drawings. And if you do have backstops, then hook it up, the one that's at the entrance, hook it up the remote control rope. So you don't make all those cattle just go clunking through that thing. But you better make sure it doesn't jiggle. That backstop's jiggling like that, they're not going to want to go in. Now, in a lot of uh, pre-made facilities, you know, these put together with panels, there's metal struts that go on the ground because it's got to hold the facility together. And if you've got a metal strut right at your single file chute entrance, cover it up with dirt and they'll move over it. This is the black hole. Real sunny outside, real dark inside, they don't want to go. Now, at night, <coughs> this facility will work fine at night because they'll head towards the light. You light it up, they head towards the light. On a sunny day, it will work terrible. Now, one of the problems I have with the sun is even if I put a lot of lights in there, I can't buy lights that can compete with the sun. Now, somebody did try putting a carbon arc light in a building. It's a good way to burn down your building and, and uh, uh, blow up every electrical circuit. No, no, but any reasonable kind of light cannot get as bright as the sun. You've got to get natural daylight in there. At this feed yard, they retrofitted it with white translucent panels on the opposite wall. So as the cattle come in there, they can see natural daylight. And I really like white translucent panels because I don't want to have shadows. But I've got to get some daylight in there. Or maybe you can just open up some, some doors 
I've been in some places where all I did was open up more doors in the side of the building, and that changed how the cattle went in. Now, sometimes you get a distraction that you just can't do anything about. There's a big water puddle there at the gate, and what you got to do is let the leader come up, put its head down, and take a look. You push it up that hard, they're going to turn back on you. Let your leader take a look. And then after the leader cautiously walks over the water, the other cattle are going to follow. Yeah, some distractions I can't get rid of. I don't know, I've got that puddle there. You have things like getting them to cross the white line on the highway. They've got to go across the street and buck at the white line. Let the leader put the head down, take a look. Cattle have wide angle vision, and their vision is designed so that when they're grazing, they can see all around scanning for predators. And a human being has got a round fovea in the eye. Cattle have a horizontal one. And they do not see red. They're partially colorblind. They're not black and white colorblind. They have sensors for yellowish green and bluish purple. So grass and all those kind of things, they see really well. And giving up the red sensor gives them better night vision. And they really tune into contrast. And, but their depth perception is lousy. They've got depth perception. But they've got to stop and put that head down. They see a shadow, well, maybe it might be a hole in the ground. You know, they've got to stop and look. All right, here's a backstop gate right at the entrance of a chute, kind of thing that will make them balk. That needs to be tied open. You know, I find it just sometimes very simple things like tying that open. I'd actually rather have a sliding door there. Um, because they're going to go in so much easier if you don't have the backstop gate. Move small groups up into the crowd pen. When you're working in the corrals, good handling is going to require a lot more walking to bring up small groups. Because I want to be able to use the following behavior. So I bring them up, go through the crowd pen, whatever you got, and into the single file chute. I find I'm constantly am fighting people wanting to move larger groups because they don't want to do the walking. Nope, you're going to have to walk, do a good job. Uh, good handling, that requires a lot more walking. That was a cute picture that Cheryl found for me. Fill the crowd pen half full. <coughs> now you can see a few vehicles there. If your crowd pen holds 10 stuffed, put five or six in and fill it half full. They are not toothpaste. People think they can just squash them with gates in. Uh-uh, no, 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 no. Now, the one place you really need to have a solid gate is the crowd gate. That should be a solid gate. So they're less likely to turn back and ram that back in your face. Here's the animal's um, flight zone. You can kind of look at it like as a bubble around the person. Now, a tame 4-H steer, he has no flight zone at all. You've got to lead him. A lot of the cattle here are going to be really tame. You lead them. And, and what determines the size of the flight zone? Amount of contact with people. Cattle that are around people all the time have a smaller flight zone. Genetics and the quality of that contact. Have they been handled calmly and gently or have they been screamed at? And the research is very clear. Yelling and screaming at cattle is stressful. There were two Canadian studies. Joe Stuckey up at... Um, up in Saskatchewan and Jeffrey Russian, also in Canada. And what Joe Stuckey found that's very, very interesting is that um, when you scream and yell at animals and whistle, the heart rate goes up more than the sound of gates smacking, you know, just the squeeze shoot banging around. Those animals know that that yelling and screaming is directed at them. So let's get quieted down. No whistling, no screaming. Quiet down. When you enter the flight zone, now they're going to move away. Now you've got uh, some animals really far away. Well, they're not even aware of your presence. And you've got one animal, he knows you're there, but he doesn't feel like he's quite got to get up yet. Now here is a really handy way to get animals into the squeeze chute without the electric prod. And it's kind of counterintuitive. Now the biggest mistake I see people make is they stand right here at the head. I hope you can see that arrow all right. Stand at the head and poke it on the butt. I constantly 
saying, no, don't do that. If you want it to go forward, you've got to be behind his shoulder. And when you're right up close to the cattle in the chute, that point of balance will be at the shoulder. You get out on the pasture, it might be just behind it, just right at the eye. But in the chute, it's going to be at the shoulder. So what you do, let's just pretend that this is the tailgate to the squeeze chute. So I'm going to push these chairs in so I don't trip over them. And I'm going to do this motion. I, let's say cattle lined up in this. I'm standing about here, just outside the flight zone. I step forward inside the flight zone and quickly walk back by them. And when I cross that shoulder, they'll go forward. This is a real handy dandy little trick. Now if I do it too slow, like this, they'll just back up on you. You kind of got to make kind of a decisive movement, step forward, walk back by them. Now obviously I don't want free cattle going in the squeeze chute. So if I, if I step forward, walk back by them, I can stop right there where I got the arrow, and the next animal will not go forward. The principle is you go inside the flight zone in the opposite direction of desired movement. Speeds them up. It also works out on pasture. Outside the flight zone in the same direction. Sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it really, really works. And I found that by using this method, I could greatly reduce the electric prod use. So what's my opinion of electric prods? Get it out of your hand. It never, never, never is your primary driving tool. But once in a while, you're going to get some old cow that decides she's not going to go in the squeeze chute. Now, I've had some people tell me they can get every cow in the squeeze chute without an electric prod. I don't believe that. There are a few of them. That, you know, be, and the reason why she won't go in is because in the past she got her head nutcrackered or some other really bad thing, and she's learned that's a really bad place. And this brings up another thing. An animal's first experience in the corrals needs to be a good experience. So you got young heifers. Let's spend some time just walking them through the facility. Make those first experiences good first experiences. Because if they're bad first experiences, they don't get over it. Now, there's been a lot of discussion about solid versus open fences. Now, this is a facility that has a, a solid fence on the outer perimeter. That's one of the most important places to have a solid fence. So when the pickups and the cars are parked next to it, and there's cars going by on the highway, they don't see that. Now, if you have an open fence, you have to stay away from it. Remember about the flight zone. If you stand up close to that fence and you're in the flight zone, well, they're going to go like this, and they're going to start crapping and going like this, and they get antsy. Then you, let's say this is a, it's got a solid fence here, and i got an open fence here, and I'm standing right up here like this, the cattle are getting antsy. I back up, and I may not have enough room here to back up. I may have to get further away than this. They'll calm right down. And, and you have to have, if you have open fences, you have to have a people-free zone around that open fence, except when you specifically enter it to move it. And then the rest of the time, you've got to stand back away from it. And if you're going to have everybody and his mother out there for a big party handling cattle, then you might as well just cover it all up. Um, but it, you can, I've actually drawn lines in the dirt of where you have to stand behind it. And if, I, if people stood behind the line, even a whole pile of people stood behind the line, they stayed calm. As soon as people crept forward, they started to get in that flight zone. Then you start to get this, and then you get rearing. You have an animal rear up in the chute, back off. Just back off. There's an animal rearing in the chute, back off. In fact, this facility's got the solid outer fence and a partial see-through on the inner fence. Yes, Guy, and I see the hot shot that you should not be carrying right there. You should not be carrying that. But you have that animal that absolutely won't go. You use it once and then put it away. That's better than hard tail cranking. And that's about the only place that you probably ever really need it. Something choking in the squeeze chute to get it to get up before it dies. Animal down at a truck stop. Those are some places where you need an electric prod. So I don't suggest banning them. But the one thing I'm going to be adamant about is get it out of your hand. And I like the little nylon flags. I think those are really nice. But people tend to overuse driving aids, whipping and hitting. Um, one of my students just graduated this year in December. And her dad came up and went to the local auction market. 
and didn't like the way they were whipping cattle in the face with a driving aid. No, that's not good. No, you want to use driving aids just very quietly, direct to move cattle, not be hitting them. Okay, what's the optimal shoot length? Okay, if I bring up five or six cattle at a time, and I have them pass through the crowd pan, if they can go right into the shoot and fill it up, you get that following behavior. You want to wait until that single file shoot is almost empty, and then bring the cattle in and, and, and use the following behavior. Nothing's worse than just having space for one animal in there, so I bring them in and I'm trying to force them in there like onesies at a time. Wait until it's partially empty. And you need to have enough length. I mean, you need to have a long enough shoot that it holds four or five full-sized adult cows. No, I don't want something holding 20 cattle. Something's going to go down in that. Yeah, I'd have that for a packing plant, but not for a ranch. But four or five cows. So if somebody has a facility where maybe the lead-up shoot only holds one or two, this is where another set of panels to make it just a little bit longer is really going to improve the handling. So I can use the following behavior. I mean, a shoot that's got like one cow of space in it, those, those are just terrible. That's a real simple change. This one right here, they put a piece of plywood in there. Cattle can, you can still um, work it without a catwalk. Um, you know, there's some advantages to working without a catwalk. I'm finding now that I'm older, I'm having a harder time getting down, up and down off of catwalks. Um, but even this for the partially solid side, you've got to stay away from it, except for when you go in there to move the animals. Here's a simple little trick you can try in your squeeze chute. This piece of cardboard was put on the back half of the squeeze chute because you've got to stand here. You've got to stand close to it. This is where you need some solid sides. And, and so when you're standing there and the cattle come in, they don't see you standing there. Just try covering the back half. And you need to use something that's stiff, not something that flaps and moves, but a stiff material. And it's amazing, a little piece of cardboard there, and they come in so much easier. Because, yeah, you do have to stand there, operate the chute. All right, how about open versus solid sides? This is something that's kind of a bit of a controversy right now, low stress handling. Um, if you have an open sided chute, you have to maintain a people free zone around it, unless your cattle are total tame, haul to broke pets. But if they have any flight zone at all, um, I definitely would recommend covering up outer perimeters, um, unless it's out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, using open sides is going to require more skill because if you stand in the flight zone, then the animals are going to get upset. Also, it's better to have cattle acclimated to low-stress handling. If I got some wild mountain cattle, it's wilder than heck, I want to just make it solid. On the solid sides, I want to block that outer perimeter. It's better for less skilled people or super wild cattle. And I think most of you understand that most of your work is in the east to southeast probably going to have less super wild cattle. I just want to explain one other thing that's going to affect flight zone size. You're probably not going to have a problem with that here. Is worked on a horse versus worked on the ground. I've seen some really awful stuff at meat packing plants where we get some cattle in. These are fed cattle, not old cows, but fed cattle that have never been worked by a man on foot. They meet their first man on foot at a plant and they're bouncing off the walls. Because no matter where that man goes, he's inside the flight zone. You see, a man on a horse and a man on the ground is a different picture. So they have learned that the man on the horse is safe. The man on the ground is something new and scary. It's really important before animals leave a ranch that they get accustomed to being worked on foot, going in and out of pens on foot before you send them down to sale barns, feed yards, and packing plants. This shows some of my curved facilities. Now, if you're going to use a curved facility, you want to lay it out so they make a full half circle. You see, cattle have a natural tendency to go back to where they come from. So you want to go a full half circle. You know, little quarter circle tubs that sort of go like this are kind of useless. You know, one of the best ways to fix those is to add some more panels and get the full half circle. So you take advantage of that natural tendency to go back to where they come from. But you've got to lay them out right. If, I'll imagine that arrow's the nose of an animal. When that animal's standing right there, he's got to be able to see up their two body lengths. If you bend too sharp right here, it will not work. Now on this one, this is a very expensive facility with a walking platform. That's like really nice, it's really expensive. But one good thing here, they got the backstop tied open. 
I like that. You know, instead of making all those cattle go clumping through those backstops. And they got one backstop right here, two body lengths behind the squeeze. That's sometimes a good place to have a backstop because then the leaders don't back out. I find I go into a lot of facilities, I'm tying backstops up. Oh, they might have five backstops in a, in a single file shoot. I'll tie most of them open. If cattle are constantly backing up, you need to figure out why they're backing up and fix it rather than just putting in more and more backstops. Okay, this is a really important slide. Don't dead end your, your, um, your single file shoot. This is laid out going around in a full half circle. Now another thing you'll see on that layout, it's got one straight side and one side on a 30 degree angle. So let's say you just have a kind of a crowd pen that just goes in straight. One side straight and the other side on a 30 degree angle. Don't make it like this. And don't make them too narrow like that to jam in that. That's a real mess. Uh, but that one side straight. Another thing I'm really getting high on right now is what I call working the pivot. And then you can get rid of all the catwalks around here. And you stand here. Might make a little catwalk there to stand on, just a little tiny one. And you make those cattle come on right on around you. Working the pivot really works nice. I was just out at, um, oh, this Iowa Premium Beef, beautiful new plant. Oh, it's working just great. I was showing them how to work the pivot. Man, it's working beautiful. Came right around the curved uh, pan. And I was also showing them how to batch bunches. You know, instead of, um, uh, you know, bring up, you know, batch timing bunches of cattle. Because if you fill the crowd pen up and the chute's full, what do they do? They turn around on you. Now, of course, that's a plant. So you've got maybe 20 cattle in that chute. Bring them up. Uh, go right through the crowd pen. You want to use crowd pens as passing through pen. Because if your chute's full and I fill up the crowd pen, I don't care what kind of crowd pen you got, i uh, they're going to turn around on you. You want them to go into the chute, not turn around on you. All right, this is one of my new simpler designs. You know, people are saying, oh, we've got to have some things that aren't quite so expensive. These layout, this layout is on grandon.com in the equipment session. Very simple layout. Um, solid fence on the outer perimeter, you know, partially solid on the inner. A little place there to work the pivot point. So what you do is you just... Bring the cattle up here, shut the gate, and you just shut the gate right to here. I like to treat the crowd gate on a tub as an emergency break. Most of the time I don't push the gate around. I just shut it right there. And then get right up on that with the flag and it come right on around. And the only time I'm going to use that crowd gate is if I get a single left, like a single heifer left, and she's going crazy. Then I'm going to use the crowd gate. It's the emergency break. I don't want her to jump out. But the rest of the time, you don't need to be squashing and pushing with the crowd gate. This, is, this kind of layout here can be very easily laid out in portable panels. Nice and simple. This is another little layout that I've got, much simpler one, designed again to work from the pivot. And one really important thing is now the cows, the arrow's pointing the wrong way now. But when the animal's nose is there at that entrance, it can see up there. And this is the bud box. And very, very, very simple. Now, this is an example of a design that is easy to build but skill dependent. You better not put too many cattle in this. Principle is you put the cattle into a basically a dead ended alley, and then when they turn around, you make them circle around you. Now, you can see on the dotted line there, you kind of have a virtual curved chute in there as they come around you. Remember how I showed you how you have the flight zone with a um, like a bubble, and, they, and you can stand in the right place to come on around you. Now, I definitely wouldn't recommend this with super wild cattle. Now, there's been getting to be a lot more interest in simpler facilities, and I think one of the reasons for this is there's been 20 years of temperament selection. My student, Bridget Foisenay, back in the mid-'90s, did one of the first studies that showed that calm cattle gain more weight. So a lot of breed associations now have been doing EPDs for temperament. That's been going on for 20 years. Cattle aren't quite, a lot of cattle aren't as wild as they used to be. And they're easier to handle in simpler facilities. This is an example of something that's simple to build, but skill dependent. 
Now, my favorite driving aid is the little nylon flags. I really like those. I mean, I find that paddles are heavy, but a lot of this is personal preference. A lot of people like paddles. I happen to like these flags. And this just shows curved race system. Got a really nice sliding gate right there. That's, uh, uh, I really like the uh, sliding gate. And the meat packing plants, we got so many much activity going around, need to just cover up the sides. You know, one of the things you can do, a solid side thing, is experiment. Get some thin plywood or something like that and experiment. Uh, outer perimeters around truck loading ramps, yes, that's one place that needs to be covered up. All right, there's kind of two different ways in designing things. You can go simple, economical, but requires a lot more skill to operate. One time I went over to my friend's house, Nancy Earlbeck, and she raised a sheep, and she'd just gotten in some really wild sheep. And they had like no hand like facility. She managed to corral them behind a panel just by how where she stood. In other words, super skill dependent. Or you can have something that's more expensive and it's a lot easier for unskilled people to use it. Okay, here are some behavioral principles of restraint. The squeeze chute, non-slip flooring on scales, uh, stock trailers, squeeze chutes. I cannot emphasize that enough. Animals panic when they start to slip. Sudden jerky motion scares, both seeing it or feeling it. With hydraulic chutes, no, you don't need to squash them flat. Um, there's an optimal pressure, not too tight, not too loose. Hydraulic chutes are actually safer um, because you don't have all the bars sticking out that can bash your head off. And if you've got a manual chute, I cannot emphasize enough latch maintenance. And if it's a friction-type latch, never oil a friction-type latch. A ratchet latch, you know, where it goes in a notch, that you can oil. And when these latches get damaged, please replace them. Because when latches fail, that's when there's been very severe injuries like busted jaw and blocking vision, you know, because you have to be up close to them in scales. That's where you definitely need a solid side. Okay, non-slip flooring. See that nice woven tire mat? They're expensive, but they're really nice for in front of the squeeze chute. Okay, let's test your powers of observation. How many people noticed the sunbeam there that the animals locked on like radar? Raise your hand if you saw that before I mentioned it. Because that's one of the things I want you doing is I want you to become a better observer. You know, be more aware. What's your animal looking at? It's looking right at that sunbeam. Now, another time of day, that's not going to be there. Now, my student, Ruth Woolley-Woody, and also students at Kansas State University with Dan Thompson, have done some surveys of cattle handling at feed guards. It has definitely improved. You know, the beef quality assurance um, stuff, uh, that's really beginning to sink in a lot of managers. I was really pleased with these results. 28 feed yards in Nebraska, Kansas, and Colorado. 5.5% prod score, that's like excellent. And the worst yard used it on about half the cattle. Boy, in the bad old days, they used to use it like five times on every single one of them. Focalization, when you catch an animal in a squeeze chute, he should not move. If he moves because you crunch him like this, if he moves right when you catch him, you're hurting him. And, and he shouldn't be moving, you know, from a hot shot or something else. Falling down, less than 1%. Stumbling, that's where they go down on a knee. Miscaught around the middle. About 2% of the cattle are miscaught around the middle. And about 31% ran out of the squeeze chute really fast. These are super good scores. This is something that's a very positive thing that's happened. Handling, at least in the big feed yards, has improved. Now, unfortunately, there was one feed yard that had a stupid boy in his 20s, a music player in his ears, who decided to rip out ear tags without cutting them first and tore the cattle's ears. And everybody else was wonderful. What if somebody gets a video of that stupid thing? You know, management's got to control that sort of stuff. And it was a contract crew. And contract crews can be okay, but you've got to really watch them. And paying people on piecework isn't necessarily the best way to pay people because it motivates just going super fast. This is my student's original work on cattle temperament. And she found that the animals that had a four, these are the ones that went berserk in the squeeze, should have lower weight gain. 
Now today, a lot of people are doing exit speed scoring because a hydraulic squeeze chute holds the animal really tight. So chute scoring doesn't work as well. And you can actually do this walk, trot, canter exit speed scoring. Or you can do it electronically where you get a hard number. And, and temperament is heritable. Now, I want to warn, let's be careful not to overselect for temperament because it's genetic differences in how mama cows defend the baby. This is a study that my student did, Ron, um, Connie Flerka, with red Angus mama cows with newborn calves, and she threatened them with an old Jimmy vehicle that was totally different than the, the ranch trucks, come around like this, and at what point does the cow orient? And then she shoot it with a laser range finder, get the distance. Some cows call the calf, some cows don't call the calf. And a few bad cows just walked away and left the calf. Yeah, we need to select for temperament, but I don't want to turn all the beef cattle into Holsteins. That would probably not be a good idea. And I'm getting concerned about over-selection for just traits. I mean, now we got genomic EBTs. Be careful with those power tools. We still need to be looking at animals. Now, this just shows stress during handling. I get animals really upset during handling. The cortisol levels get really high. I, an animal that's trained to handling, like these trained antelope that I work with, the stress levels are low. There's a very basic principle. When you force animals to do something, the fear stress levels go way up, the cortisol levels go way up. There's some research that shows that acclimating cattle to handling can improve AI conception rates. They get all scared and upset during AI. You're going to get poorer conception rates. First experiences with new places need to be good first experiences. You know, a number of people that are teaching low stress handling, like Ron Gill at Texas A&M, really suggests taking a new heifer. Spend some time with your heifers, walking amongst them, calming them down, training them, take them through the facility. And there's research that shows Careful handling lowers cortisol. These are some of the newer papers. Heifers are acclimated to the shoots, have better reproductive performance. And there's some old research that shows the same thing. Acclimating cattle is a really good thing to do. New things are attractive when the animal can voluntarily approach and scary when you shove it in their face. So some photographic equipment put out in the field, they come up to it. That's kind of the paradox of novelty. You want to get animals used to different vehicles, used to different people, because some of the worst cattle that just blow up at an auction are the ones that have lived too sheltered a life. They've just had one person feeding them. They see a different vehicle. They freak out over it. And this is going to be a greater problem with the genetically more excitable cattle. You know, some of the old Herefords are really calm. Didn't matter so much with them. Animal memories are super specific. All right, here's an interesting study that was recently published in the Journal of Animal Science. Okay, you've got cows that are used to people um, uh, dishing up range cubes, but that didn't transfer to in the squeeze chute. You see, that's a different picture. You see, their memories are sensory based. If uh, this is a nice ex uh, experiment by Leonor and Fant, if you habituate an animal to a blue and white umbrella, it doesn't acclimate to a tarp. Think about it. The umbrella is a different picture than the tarp. They look totally different. No, you want to acclimate them to a lot of different things. We already talked about the man on the horse and the man on the ground. We already discussed that. But think about it. It's a different picture. Let's get rid of the dogs around the chutes. Hate dogs around chutes. You know, I've seen some dogs used well in the field. I think most people. A lot of people in this part of the country are going to be just leading cattle. No dogs around the shoes. It teaches them to kick. And I've almost had my head kicked off twice by cattle that have been bitten by dogs at the packing plant. Acclimate them to different vehicles, different things. You manage stuff that you measure. I'm a big fan of measuring stuff. And we've got to prevent bad from becoming normal. Lameness in the dairy cow right now is terrible. I just reviewed the literature. It's worse now than it was five years ago by about 5%. It's like a 30-some percent. There's a new paper by Von Kaiserlink, Dan Weary from the University of British Columbia. He surveyed California dairies. It's not pretty. That's bad becoming normal. 
the really good dairies, they had it at 5%. You know, when cows have gotten bigger, they don't fit in the stalls anymore in a freestall barn. Okay, so let's score handling. How many animals run during handling? How many animals fell? How many animals stumbled? How many animals moved right when you catch them? How many were moved with electric prod? I hope it's like nine or maybe one. You know, that needs to be really low. But the advantage of measuring stuff is that I can tell, <coughs> am I getting better or am I getting worse? You know, you do weight gain, you do weaning percentage. Let's also measure handling. And there's some differences between um, hard to handle and agitated cattle. You know, this kind of data will look, will look like this. Ones that have never seen a man on foot, they now get to meet their first man on foot. That's a real mess. Now, I've done a lot of animal welfare work with McDonald's and in, on, and when you had a big supplier insisting that plants had to improve, they improved. In 1996, only 30% of the plants could stun 95% of the cattle. You know why they, were, why they were so bad? Maintenance. They simply didn't take care of their equipment. So the first thing we did is make them fix all that broken junk. And then they made a lot of simple changes like non slip flooring, lighting, adding strategically located solid panels, and training and management. And it got a whole lot better. But one of the things that frustrates me is we've really got the slaughterhouses working well and the public doesn't know about it. That's why we put up beef plant video tour with Temple Grandin, pork plant video tour, turkey plant video tour. Ag has got to show the good things that we do. And then there's some practices that are going to have to be changed. OK. Now, in looking at things, I'm looking at directly observable things. It's not a paperwork audit. Oh, man, the bureaucrats want to turn it all into paperwork audit. I can't believe some of the stupid things. I've been following the FFA rules for drones. Well, I have a client who bought a little drone, and he took pictures of his business with it. Now, this is just really dumb. Now, if he posts those pictures on his Facebook page, that's OK, because that's personal and it's hobby. If he posts that picture of his business on his business web page, that violates FFA rules because it's commercial. Yeah, we need to be really strict about keeping these things away from airports. And some idiot took one of those drones, flew it out to an airport to get the top photos of the tops of planes landing. Are you nuts? <laughs> That's going to take out an engine if that goes in an engine. Even a little small drone can take out an engine. They fly all the time. You keep those things away from the airport. OK, looking at things I might audit in animal welfare. Things like lameness, handling scores, those are outcome-based variables. You know, they're real simple things. A moment, um, you know, there's a tendency in some of the European rules to try to tell people exactly how to do things. I think a better approach is let's measure the outcome. I'm not going to tell you how to build free stalls or what kind of dairy cows to breed or whatever, but let's get the lameness way down. 30% is disgusting on lame cows. Many different things cause lameness. I'm going to just measure the outcome, watch them when they exit the milking parlor. Then you have some practices you don't do, and roughing up cattle is one of them. And then there's still a few input variables you need, like maybe truck loading densities. Uh, let's look at all the different things that can make cattle lame. Toe abscesses, they scuff their feet when they're handled. Rapid growth, poor leg conformation. I'm starting to see leg conformation issues in beef cattle. And they're the same mistakes the pig industry made in the 80s. You don't want to go down that same road. Foot diseases, beta agonists in hot weather. There's something with beta agonists in hot weather that's bad. Don't seem to have these problems in the, in the wintertime, you know, with things like ractopamine and sulpaterol and optiflex. Leg conformation. There's too many animals that are too straight, collapsed in the ankle. My student, Demarcy uh, <coughs> Franks, just finished up her master's, and she did a study where she went to the four major semen websites, looked at every beef bull of Angus, Hereford, Simmental, and Red Angus, and looked at how much of the feet and legs was visible that wasn't covered with photoshopped grass. Let me tell you, the photoshopping, it's blatant. It's not even good photoshopping. I just went through the bull edition of a magazine just recently, and I'm going, you don't even know how to do photoshop right. But you got it. 
this far up their leg, only 19% of the pictures of the beef bowls were the entire hoof fully visible. Yeah, and some of these animals are post-legged and they have difficulty walking. How's a bull going to work if he's got bad conformation? All I need to get the Photoshop off the, these pictures. Well, there's a pig with a really disgusting foot. We certainly don't want cattle going down this route. And they're starting to do it. And it's probably linked with um, some really nice EPT with things like carcass traits. Be careful with those power tools. I'm not saying don't use them, but there's still a need to visually look at cattle. Some people don't think you have to look at cattle anymore. You need to do it to keep out of trouble. Well, that's a defect. It came out in the 2010 Feedstuffs magazine. That's a defect. Well, and there's some things that um, we definitely should not be doing, like poking sensitive areas. Good people don't do that. Dragging downers. You know, if you look through some of the recent bad activist videos of just rough handling, the worst ones are out right now that are recent are dairy. And Whole Foods just got bashed. There's a new animal rights group out I've never even heard of that went into a cage-free chicken house. Paper, the article about it just came out on Friday in the New York Times. They went into this chicken house in California ten times, and they found four or five birds that were in a bad state. They probably should have been culled. They had to go in there ten times to find them. And then they just show close-ups of these bad birds. I don't even know what the rest of the house looks like. I could see a few good chickens in the background, but I couldn't evaluate whether I thought this place was good or bad because it only showed close-ups of bad birds. They didn't show the rest of the birds. Well, that's kind of biased, and they're saying... Their slogan is, this is not food, it's violence. Well, I called up a friend of mine at Whole Foods, and I said, you need to have open house at that place, like now. Get the hazmat suits. They have to sign an affidavit that they're bird-free for 48 hours. Uh, you, better, you better have open house there. When you get bashed, you better be opening a door up. And when does beating an animal, when does tapping an animal with a paddle become beating? You see, the USDA has rules about minimize agitation and excitement. So I got a little video up on proper use of livestock driving tools. And when does whacking with a paddle become beating? Well, when it starts to break cardboard box, that becomes beating. And then you have some input measures, like you no know, water requirements, some space requirements. And that's my website. And we've got some time for questions. And that's the part I really like, is the time for questions. And if nobody has a question, I'm going to start picking people. So hopefully, <coughs> somebody's got some questions. Okay, who, okay, right there. Yeah, clipping the hair. Well, they don't like the sound of the clippers. You see, anything that is new, they tend to be afraid of. Um, sometimes if you just, you know, turn the thing on and wait for a few seconds before you put it on, them helps. So it's not such a big surprise. Hopefully you've got them a decent squeeze chute that you're putting them in for doing that. Because I think if you have an animal, if you, you need to hold them so they don't, I think if they get struggling and flipping around and stuff, you get a lot more stress. Well, that's right. That's where a good squeeze shoot's a good thing to have. But they're scared of the sound. You know, now this would be time consuming, but ideally I'd like to get them used to that sound before you do it. Maybe you could get it on an audio recording and put it somewhere where the cattle could hear that sound intermittently, not continuous, but intermittently before they actually have to do it. See, the more you can do to make it less a surprise, less novel. See, what tends to frighten cattle is sudden novelty shoved in their face. So you've put them in the squeeze chute, and they're good about shots and things like that, and then you turn that thing on, and it's a novel sound. And I'd try to find a clipper that's less high-pitched noise. Uh, that would probably also help. But to make it less of a surprise, now the thing is to lessen that is going to um, require time. See, a lot of things in low-stress handling, people go, oh, I don't have the time to do that. But maybe you ought to, where, where are the cattle housed? Are they out on a pasture? Or are they? Now, if you bring them in the night before, you could have maybe something with a little intermittent sound. Um, 
in the corrals. Um, so it's not such a surprise. You see, that's a completely novel sound. The other thing is, just for your own safety, I hope you have a good squeeze chute. Then they can't move and break your arm. Well, yeah, that you'd use just for anything in the, in the squeeze chute. See, but I think a lot of that, they're reacting to the sound because it's completely novel and it's also a very novel feeling. See, where the cardboard really helps is so that when you're standing there operating the squeeze chute, they don't see you standing there. That helps get them into the squeeze chute. I, uh, you know, just holding them tight enough so they can't move and hurt you uh, because you're going to get some animals that don't acclimate well. And it's going to be, uh, we found that there's a relationship between temperament and little hair whorls. Cattle that have a hair whorl way up high here uh, tend to get more upset about things. Now, we've collected hair whorl data for a lot of years, and some data we collected in Nebraska, uh, there were fewer animals, because we've had all the years of temperament selection, that have it way up here, at least in Nebraska. Uh, <coughs> but that's something to try to help acclimate them to that sound. You know, the other thing is the first experience. If the first experience they have in a clipper is you shove it in their face and she got really upset, they don't forget. They got super good memories and they don't forget bad things. Did you talk about slow is fast? Slow is faster, that's right. Well, I can remember, um, oh, people, uh, I remember one time I went out to this pig place and I showed them that if they moved five at a time instead of ten at a time, they could load the truck faster. Because what they used to do is just go in and burn up every hog in the pen with a hot shot. See, once you get cattle upset, it takes almost half an hour to calm back down. So let's say you brought some cattle in and they got a bit upset and you got them in the corrals. Let's take a half an hour break. Let's, you know, let's just let them calm down. Because when they get upset, they stick together like glue. And the high-strung genetics sticks together more than the calmer genetics. See, there's interactions with genetics. And calm is also a good way to not get hurt handling cattle. No, slow is faster. The other thing that's really a hard concept to get people to do is timing bunches. Okay, let's say I have a lead-up chute where I can hold one in the squeeze chute and five in the lead-up, you know, full-size cows. Well, then you want to wait until you have one in the squeeze chute. You bring your next bunch up and five fill up the chute. I don't want a single leftover because a single leftover is gonna, in the crowd pen is going to give me trouble regardless of what kind of crowd pen I've got. Single cattle also hurt people. I get called in and do expert witness stuff where cattle have injured people. And the big things, oh, bulls is big number one, and they're off in the hand-reared pats. And big number two is single cattle. Going berserk, running over people, shoving gates back in people's face. So you want to time your bunch. So you have, just as the, the last cow enters that squeeze chute, I'm bringing my next bunch of five up and they just go right on in. It's a hard concept, I find, to get people to let the handling facility get half empty. They want to jam everything full and I have to fight against that mindset. I went over to the Iowa Beef I'm, you know, they, and I went to another plant and this really big plant, 390 an hour, and even there, well their chute holds like, like 30 cattle to fit in their chute, so it doesn't run out that fast but I was showing them how to time bunches. And they had a round, really nice round crowd pen setup that we'd laid out. Come up like this, go around that round crowd pen without stopping. They think they're headed back to the yards, race up the chute. But let that stage in there, they actually get half empty. And I said, look at how nice they handle. Because if I bring them up there when the chute's full, they turn around on you. And then they're harder to get out. You see, it's hard for people to kind of get it through their head to not stuff everything full shoving with crowd gates. I want to get away from pushing with the crowd gates. Yes, I am going to have a crowd gate on the round crowd pen, but 95% of the time I put it on the first notch and I don't crowd with it. It's only there if I get a single that's getting upset and then I need to use it to stop her from jumping out. 
It's an emergency brake. It's not something you use all the time. I wouldn't not have an emergency brake in a car. You know, because everything else has gone wrong, I've got to have some way to stop it. And then I show them how they come on around. But to learn some of these techniques, like timing bunches, it's going to be slower while you're learning. That's the thing. You've got to suffer a little bit before you get the gain from it. But nothing's worse than your single file shoots chock full. I fill up the crowd pen, jam it full, and every animal is turned around in the wrong direction. And then that's when the hot shots are brought out in the crowd pen. Recently, I went to, um, let's go back to, uh, go back to this design right here. <coughs> yeah, this, this little layout right here. These are getting quite, uh, oh, now it's not on the screen now. What? Okay, I don't know why that went off the screen. But I'm, okay, if I do that, it comes, okay. You hope it does that. But on using this, uh, people want to take that staging alley and just, now I just want to wait. They want to take the alley that leads up to just jam it full of cattle. No, I want it so that when the last animal goes to squeeze you, they bring five more up and they just walk on in. In other words, let, regardless of what kind of crowd pen you have, use it as a passing through pen. Crowd pens are passing through pens. Use the following. And if your single file shoot only holds two cattle, I could get, if you get some more panels. I think your single file ought to hold about five. You know, that, that's um, uh, 30 feet long kind of minimum. Yeah, you don't want to get it too long because they're going to get cattle down in it. But you want to have it long enough so you can actually use some following behavior. Okay? Well, you have cattle that have no flights on. And basically... With those, you got to lead them. Okay, let's say about going into squeeze shoot. Then you train them that when you get in squeeze shoot, you get a feed treat. I've, I, I trained sheep one time uh, to go on the tilt table, and then run around and wait at the gate to come back in again. And all I gave them was a teaspoon of grain each time, just a tiny taste. I didn't have to worry about making them sick. They only got that much grain. You know, it was horse feed, the sweet stuff. I've done those. It's better off you train them that when you do what you want, you just reward them. You also have to make sure they don't get pushy. You get really tame animals and they're pushing on you. They want you to scratch their back. Well, then you take your hands off. If she pushes, you take your hands off. If she pushes, you don't open the gate. Pushy behavior, you don't hit them. Usually you can, you can just reward the behavior you want. It's simple operant conditioning. But they have to get the reward within one second or they don't make the connection. Animals have got a lousy um, association. Well, I was just working the other day with one of my students. He had to get a horse to stand still for a blood test. She'd give him a treat, and he's jumping all around. I said, don't give him a treat when he's jumping around. When he still give him the treat. Well, it started working, like, right away. So the cow goes in the squeeze shoe, then it gets a little, you know, treat. Now, you have to make sure that the animal knows what this treat is, you know, uh, and that it really tastes good. And, of course, I wouldn't want cattle eating too much horse feed. But you don't need only that much grain. That's all you have to give her, just a taste. They have found in zoos that you can use one marshmallow to train an elephant. Because you know, it likes that little, um, it's one little marshmallow. You're not going to make it sick feeding it one marshmallow. You know, it doesn't have to be a whole lot. You don't have to worry about making them sick. It can be a really, really small amount. Then you get an old cow, she just gets pushy. Well, I went out to, it was out at New Mexico State, and this cow was getting pushy, and, and I, I was scratching her on the back, and she pushed on me. I just took my hand off. She leaned on me. I took my hand off. She stopped doing it. Okay, well, I went out to a university. They had this type of a layout like this set up with portable panels. I walk in there. It's a lab. I'm not going to say where it was, but I walked in there. I was visiting. They had their crowd pen jammed full. The chute was jammed full. Two guys with hot shots up on the catwalk. I said, stop it. Let's get rid of the hot shots. 
and I showed them how to work the pivot. I got a couple of girls there working the pivot, waiting until there's some space in the chute, and they just came right on around and went right in. And they're going, oh, wow, that really works. Well, they don't have to have any hot shots. The only place where an electric prod might be needed is, is right here, the, the right at the two, um, well, I mean, obviously you can't see it, point with my finger, is right there, the one real stubborn one that just won't go in the squeeze chute. No, hot shots in the crowd pen. I want to get rid of hot shots in the crowd pen completely. Okay? Uh, if you had the power to end only one bad livestock handling practice, what would it be? Just rough handling. Just people hitting and screaming. And, and, and there's, a, you know, there's a lot of people now teaching a lot of low-stress handling. And some of that's the real, you know, the real art of it. But the first thing you've got to do is you've got to stop the rough stuff. That's tiny baby basics. And we still have too many people yelling and screaming and hitting and just getting too rough and aggressive with cattle. That's the first thing you've got to do is to stop that. You've got to calm down. And then you can learn a whole lot of other things. But until you calm down, you can't learn anything about how to, about the fine art of moving cattle. See, out west, there's the big ranges is getting me a lot of interest in moving cattle without fences. There's a man down in Texas. Uh, his name is uh, Kinford in Texas, and he works on placing cattle out on really rough range. And there's some principles to that. And one of them is, you know, remember cattle like to go back to where they come from. So if your cattle are down in the riparian area and they you want to keep them out of there, the worst thing you do is scream at them, beat them up out of there because they're going to go back to the riparian area because it's safe. You want them to stay in a new place, you got to make it really slow and gentle and nice. Let the slow animals set the pace. And when you get to the place, this is Tina Williams' word. Tina Williams is the uh, daughter of Bud Williams. And when Tina, one of the things that Tina says is that when you get to the destination, you got to just wait and let them start grazing. In other words, get out of driving mode and get into stuff in your face mode, and when they start to graze in random orientations, then you can leave them. You know, and then kind of turn the leaders back into the herd first and then let them graze. So you might just sit there for half an hour and let them start grazing and get their mind on food rather than on, on uh, going back someplace. See, that's a simple behavior thing. But before you learn things like that, you got to calm down first. And I talked to some cowboys that tried to take Tina Williams' method and place some cattle. And I said to them, did you scream and yell at them? Yes. And then one of them says, I can't stand those slow cattle. I want to hurry them up. Well, Tina Williams explains you let the slow cattle set the pace. Well, you say if they maybe hadn't screamed and yelled, maybe it might have worked better. You, know. you do have to start with basics first. And people are better. Handling's getting better. I mean, stuff that been done on beef quality assurance, uh, all the emphasis with Kurt Pate going out and doing demonstrations, that's helped. But before you can even begin to learn what Kurt Pate teaches is you've got to calm down first. One more question. Okay. Uh, how small are calves? Just really little calves? And of course, they, uh, the moms get kind of upset about that. Um, there's a very clever little um, fence design to help separate calves that I can draw for you that Joe Stuckey invented. It's in my Livestock Handling and Transport book, the 2014 edition, um, to help you separate, um, separate the calves. It's, uh, it's hard to explain it. I can draw it for you. Uh, but it's difficult for me to explain it. And it's going to take quite a bit of stockmanship skill to make it work. It's one of those things that's very simple, but skill, um, skill dependent. Maybe one more quick one. We got two minutes according to this clock. Okay. Oh, yeah, they remember. Now I get asked, now what if you ear tag and castrate a two-day-old calf? I don't think they remember that young. But calves that are a couple of months old, yes, they remember. They've got good memories. So if that's, 
I would, before I separate them, I'd just bring the cows and calves into the corrals and feed them there. Let's make their first experiences in there really good. Because bad first experiences make a really horrible impression on animals. If the horse flips over backwards the first time it goes in the trailer, you might have a trailering problem forever. Unless you take a totally different type of trailer. So maybe it flipped over in a two-horse trailer. He might be okay with a big show van because that looks different. I'd recommend on training uh, horses to load. Let's start with the stock trailer first. Let's make it easy. Let's not have a wreck before you do it, go to the most hard one, the two-horse trailer. Now, let me explain an interesting experiment that was done, old experiment done by a guy named Miller with rats to show the bad effects of first experience. You have a radial arm maze. That's basically like a wagon wheel. And you put the rat in the center of the maze. It has a whole bunch of arms. So at the end of some of these arms, you got delicious chocolate chips. OK, so the rat goes down this arm. He learns he's got delicious chocolate chips. Then he enters a strange new arm, and he gets this huge shock. He will never go in that arm ever again. But OK, let's say the third arm on the maze, he goes in, he gets delicious chocolate chips. The second time he goes in, he gets a tiny tingle shock. And he goes, oh, those chips were good. Eh, I can tolerate that tingle shock. And then you gradually go and make it a little more shock. Ah, but those chocolate chips are good. I'm going to go in and get them. You can blast them pretty hard with the shock. And he'll still go in there to get the delicious chocolate chips. But if the first time he goes in a new arm on the maze, and, the, and it's horrible, he will never go in there again. You see, think about it from an anti-predator standpoint. You're living out in the range. There's a lot of wolves and stuff around, lions around and stuff. And you went down this one path, and there was a lion down there. You're probably, the first time, you're not going to want to go back there. It's a basic um, anti-predator behavior. OK, well, I think it's uh, time to, to stop. And I want to thank you all for coming. It's been great talking to you.